Good afternoon and welcome to our last live webinar in celebration of National Tile Day. We're bringing you Celebrating Installation Excellence, case studies of three award-winning ceramic tile projects. Before we get started, again a few reminders. This program is CEU accredited by AIA and NKBA. Please check the screen for a link to the online form you'll need to submit to receive your credits or request a certificate of participation. You may also submit any questions or concerns you have about CEUs to us at conference at coverings.com. All attendees are in listen-only mode. You can submit questions to our panel directly through the questions tab, and we will get to as many as we can before the session is over. Uh, for any additional questions, we'll make sure to follow up afterward. If you're having problems connecting or any other issues, please try closing your window and starting a new one. If you're having audio problems, feel free to switch from computer audio to telephone, which is listed in your invitation. Also, make sure to visit the website after this and check out some of our great content, including updated on-demand items, all in celebration of National Tile Day. And if we have space, at 3.15 p.m. right after this session, we'll be hosting a virtual tile trivia happy hour. Please visit the website to join up. I'd now like to introduce Amber Fox with National Tile Contractors Association. Amber? Hi, thank you so much for your time. I'm excited to be with you today to celebrate installation excellence. Let me just get this moving a little bit here. There we go. Um, today we'll be talking about case studies of three award-winning tile projects, which will be presented by the National Tile Contractors Association. All three projects were completed by NTCA five-star contractors and have won Project of the Year awards for installation excellence. Our NTCA five-star group is a unique and diverse group of both union and merit shop contractors who demonstrate professionalism, craftsmanship, commitment to training, service, quality, safety, and superior job performance. Our first speaker, Jeff, began his career in the tile industry in 1984 as a tile finisher, actively installing tile until 2006 when he went into project management. Jeff advanced rapidly from project manager to chief of estimating, general manager, and is now the vice president of operations for De Anza Tile, a large union shop and employee owned company in the San Francisco Bay Area. Jeff is active in the industry and serves on the board of directors for TCAA. His project, the Oakland T12 City Center in Oakland, California, won NTCA's Five Star 2020 Commercial Elite Project of the Year Achievement of Excellence Award. It is a 600,000 square foot, 24 story Class A lead silver office building. Some of the many materials used were large porcelain panels, large format porcelain pavers, 8,000 square feet on the interior and 10,000 square feet at the exterior, where a pedestal system was used to address an elevation difference from three inches to three feet. Our second speaker, Dan Salinas's journey with ceramic tile and stone started early on, being third generation with the tile craftsmanship. Dan joined the BAC local union and subsequently the apprenticeship program, later graduating as a journeyman installer and CTIOA ceramic tile consultant member. He has been a part of the Premier Tile and Marble team since 1995. His first phase with experience on every field position, journeyman finisher, apprenticeship setter, journeyman setter, foreman, and lead layout. Later shifting into second phase, with estimating and project management, assistant project manager, estimator, project manager, senior project manager, and vice president. His project, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, the Saban Building, it won NTCA's Five Star 2020 Project of the Year's People's Choice Award, as well as the recipient of the California Preservation Foundation Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Field of Historic Preservation. The restoration of an iconic 1939 streamlined modern building, preservation, rehabilitation, and replacement of 350,000 of its 500,000 24 karat gold one by one tiles. 
the future home of many iconic films and movie memorabilia. Our third speaker, Guido, started at Grazzini Brothers and Company in 1981 as a field supervisor and moved through the ranks as a project manager, then senior project manager. Guido currently serves as chief operating officer and board member. Guido has been active in the Marble Institute of America, serving as president in 2009, Minnesota Construction Association, and Minnesota Concrete and Masonry Contractors Association. Guido is a native of, of Chicago, Illinois, and has a major in architecture. His project, the SMSC Cultural Center, won NTCA's five-star 2020 Commercial Project of the Year Grand Prize winner for installation excellence. This new 41 million SMSC features 40 foot high teepees and a 92,500 square foot multi-purpose facility that serves as a community gathering space. Cult cultural activity site with a public exhibit chronicling the history of the Shakopee Metawakanton Sioux tribe. Over 28,000 square feet of ceramic and stone mosaic floor, wall tile, ceramic tile base, and glass wall tile was installed. A highlight was using river rock pebble mosaics in a pattern to mimic the look of the flowing Minnesota River. I would like to now introduce you to the moderator, Bart Bettega, Executive Director of the NTCA. Thank you, Amber. And, uh, welcome to everybody on National Tile Day. I'm uh, just ecstatic to have three unbelievable five-star projects that we can talk about today. And um, just uh, just honored that NTCA is a part of this program as, a, as an owner and partner in coverings and honored to have our members featured. And this is all about them. Uh, we, we have a chat screen or you can send questions if, as you see these three projects uh, from a technological standpoint and challenge standpoint. If you've got questions, please feel free to send those. And Amber will be looking uh, to see uh, uh, what comes in and she'll interject uh, appropriately as she runs our slides for us. Um, Michelle, would you bring up our first poll question? We want to have a little bit of fun with this. And, uh, you know, as I was sitting here uh, listening to the introductions of our speakers, uh, it just is amazing to see kind of the backgrounds that we all have in coming into the tile industry. I'm 35 years in the business, although I run a Tile Association of Installers. My background comes from distribution. Uh, and uh, in looking at Guido's background, he had way back when was in the architectural side. And Jeff and Dan, uh, in leadership roles of their respective contracting companies, came in through the apprenticeship and finishing program. So we want to ask our audience a little bit to tell us about yourselves. And we'll share that when we get the information in, which is basically what role do you play? Uh, in the tile industry? Are you an installer, a specifier, a retailer um, in distribution or manufacturing? Or if you're in another component uh, uh, of the industry, you can mark other. Uh, thank you, Michelle, uh, on that. So um, with that, uh, we'll go back to our slides. And Amber, if you could uh, uh, bring up our, our talking points, um, we will basically talk about the four things that we uh, want to accomplish in today's session, which is uh, we're going to talk real quickly about each of the three projects and we're going to bounce around a little bit uh, with our three leaders, our three speakers. We're going to talk about the challenges uh, and obstacles uh, that, that they needed to overcome in order to meet the specification and expectations of the customer. And then after we just kind of highlight what those challenges were, we're going to then dip into uh, how they overcame those challenges, basically from a technical standpoint. So the technical components of each of these award-winning installations. And then finally, Amber did a great job of, uh, of picking these three projects for a lot of reasons. There's a multitude of different products that were used, not just from the tile standpoint or natural stone uh, uh, standpoint, but also from the systems and installation technologies that they had to use and so we're going to look at that a little bit on the technology. And then finally, uh, if there's not a lot of questions at the end, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the incredible uh, skills and craftsmanship that was required that uh, to, to do this. You know, one thing we always talk about at NTCA is you know, 
you know, coming from distribution, we just didn't value at times enough uh, the installation skills and um, the technology that goes into taking a beautiful design or a beautiful specification and actually making it into a masterpiece. And it's the installer that takes that design and turns it into award-winning projects like, like, like what we just witnessed. So those are the four things we want to cover. So at this point, we're going to get into our challenges. And uh, we're going to start uh, in uh, looking at our first project, which is Dan's project. So this is out of Los Angeles. And uh, this was, I, I read the background on this, Dan, so we're bringing you into this. This is an incredible job. It's a historical preservation job. So I'm assuming that uh, you know meeting the, the high demands of your client starts with your challenges, but maybe talk to us a little bit about what you think were the top challenges that you had to overcome on this particular project. Well, um, the first thing is to, to understand the project itself. We had a tremendous landmark right here in Los Angeles from a building, you know, uh, built in the 1930s that it was designated to the historic cultural monument since 1992. So all eyes on this pro on this building uh, with lots of changes on ownership and plans for it. And at one point it did risk uh, a complete demolition. So once this was uh, assigned as a historic building, the challenges began, right? You know, you have to go through all kinds of different um, uh, rules to do anything to, to the building. You know, what percentage can you salvage and, and what are the things that you can do? At that point, um, the part of the challenge is to get in on board with all the other entities, such as a preservation technology company that we were involved with and a, also a conservator. Um, so there was two companies that were involved with this. Um, and then from there, we need to be on the same page with architectural and, and the ownership as well to try to mitigate and, and get to a good resolution to have a final product that everybody's gonna be happy with. So challenges that start early on to make sure that all the um, technicalities, materials, uh, means and methods of removal and installation, um, that everybody's on the same page with that. Say, Dan, how much, I'm just on a project like this, how much could, of a, from a challenge standpoint, do you know going in and how much is it just we're in and now we've got to deal with the changes? I mean, when it comes to the condition of a, of a project, I mean, I, I'm assuming the challenges and the change order process uh, or was it time and material took place on a daily basis? No, we did have a complete estimate to, to begin with. Okay. Uh, based on the number of tiles that we were gonna remove. And um, this project, like it was quite complicated, uh, but at the same time, very unique and very special project. Uh, things that we had never seen before. They use a, what's called a gigapan camera used by NASA. It's what they use for their uh, rover. And um, they had, you know, high resolution pictures of this to try to uh, depict any sort of cracks, elamination, uh, missing tile, and they did it from across the street um, to try to do a complete survey of how much uh, damage uh, all this gold mosaic had, you know, had taken over the years. And so we had a bit of an idea of how many tiles needed to be replaced. Then once we got into removing, you know, that was a different deal where they had to make a decision. Do we keep removing? Do we stop? What do we do? So there was a tremendous amount of meetings on a weekly basis, twice a week, many emails, many phone calls to try to decide what to do. Oh, that's great. All right. We're going to get back to you on the technology or on the uh, overcoming those challenges here shortly, but we're going to switch over to Grazzini Brothers great five-star contractor that I used to work with out of Minneapolis for, for many, many years. Uh, Guido, uh, this particular project down in, uh, uh, in Shakopee, uh, Minnesota, uh, McGuff Construction, I think, is, was the general contractor and said it was a very unique building. So maybe talk about the building itself and the challenges that you guys had to overcome on this, this incredible project that you guys did. 
Sure. You know, as you read, the, there was one 90 degree corner in the building. It's amazing. It was radius or uh, different angles. Uh, the biggest challenge was being able to convey to the design team and the owner what this installation was going to look like. Um, because it's all one dimensional. Uh, plans are one dimensional and uh, they're black and white. And uh, this is a, a, a very detailed installation. And um, so it starts at bid time. You know, you, everybody wants to do a job like this. These are great jobs to do, uh, high profile. Uh, you can really uh, showcase the, uh, the installation talent and the management talent that a company has on projects like these. If you, if you can't do that in a way where you make a dollar, uh, then your company gets put into the not-for-profit category, which is not a good place to be. So it starts at bid time. And we, as we developed our bid, we developed some of that. Uh, we identified those challenges and, and, and uh, had an outline of how we were going to get around them. Uh, but uh, as you'll see some, from some of the photos, uh, very detailed. Uh, the architectural drawings were actually very good, but they weren't detailed enough for us to, to meet that challenge. We had to, uh, we had to explain on several different levels, uh, you know, how the project was gonna come together and what it was gonna look like. Tell me a little bit about the product itself from the challenge standpoint, uh, Guido. There was, a, I think, river rock pebble materials and um, you were working with multiple thicknesses. Uh, tell me a little bit more on the material side with yours. With Dan's we saw, was restoring gold mosaics from years ago, but with yours, you've got a lot of different materials that you're having to all bring in uh, and, and to get on a monolithic type situation. Yeah, as as many of the members know, there's uh, there are issues when we bring different sizes, different thicknesses, uh, different manufacturers of tile together on a on a project when they're all intermixed, uh, because on porcelain tile calibers are different. And uh, you know when you have an eighth inch minus grout joint, you can't have that much difference. So we had to work through those issues. The pebbles, of course, uh, were a different thickness and uh, uh, a difficult animal all by themselves. They were sawn pebbles, so they were uh, they were convex on the bottom and flat on the top. And that they doesn't cut? they cut they they were cut on the cut. were they mosaics or were they individual pieces? Individual pieces mounted. They were mounted on uh, on uh, mesh mounting. Okay. Uh, but when you have a con uh, a convex uh, pebble mounted to a thin set to a floor, you have an issue with a mechanical bond. Uh, you know, there's nothing holding that in there. Uh, so if you don't use the right materials, uh, you're going to have pebbles popping and uh, you know, things not sticking. 100% coverage on a pebble this big isn't a lot of coverage. Uh, it's a small, you know, it's a small piece, and uh, so there was there were challenges there. There were patterns uh, that com were comprised of different manufactured materials, and so they had to be. Uh, you know, we had to plan that installation from the thickest material to the thinnest, so we could get a good flat uh, floor. And so there were there were several challenges. Wow. Great. Thank you for that explanation. All right, we're going to switch. Uh, we're going to switch into uh, Oakland now. So we've got one project in LA, one project in Minneapolis, and now we're going to Deanza's project uh, in Oakland. Uh, change the skyline a little bit. It said, Jeff, uh, tell us a little bit. I think you did both. Uh, if I remember right, on reading this, it's both. You had to create some transitions in, in interior and exterior as well, um, uh, and do uh, and and work with some incredibly new, beautiful, large format, thin, gauge porcelain tile materials on, on the porcelain side, which we love to see on National Tile Day is working with this new uh, new technology or certainly innovative uh, products like uh, porcelain tile in large formats. Talk a little bit about your challenges. Right. We were pretty fortunate. We had um, uh, the design team was um, incredible. They put together uh, very good details um but that you know that actually made the job more difficult you know um we had 
we had on the exterior, we had pedestals, a pedestal system, um, which with two centimeter porcelain pavers, which um, uh, what the architect was trying to accomplish was a flat um, surface for the for their clients walking in and out of the building, being out on the patio. However, uh, if they were to do that with concrete or a floated system, uh, you know, or a floated tile system, you'd end up with you know a lot of convex compound slopes to drains and and everything. So with the implementing the pedestal system, they were able to flatten their floor or flatten the, 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 the tile and by raising it above all the compound slopes. Um, but, you know, trying to, trying to adjust all the pedestals and the multiple components and stuff like that really uh, made it difficult. How challenging was it uh, to um, match the tiles themselves, the, like to book match the tiles. And I'm looking at the picture of the desk. T tell me a little bit about the desk. That looks to be almost like a cubic type. Uh, uh, there must have been a lot of cutting and a lot of fabricating, or did you fabricate? I guess we'll get into the technology a little bit, but any more challenge on the desks themselves and the book matching? Component? Yeah, a lot of a lot of compound angles. Um, you know, we we it was very difficult to meet all those angles and then the whole two dimensions for the mill worker didn't they didn't get conveyed to the mill worker during the initial install process so our our stuff came out pre-cut we tried to fabricate it off-site to begin with and then we brought it in pre-cut to the dimensions and uh, um, started the install so we had to do some modifications on site with the compound miters and and uh, piece that together. Yeah, very, very challenging. Well, wow. okay, Amber, we're going to get into the technical components, and I think we're staying with Jeff here. And so I guess we touched on it, Jeff. I've got uh, other questions uh, since I've been involved in the beginning with a lot of the training components of uh, of large format porcelain tile panels. I mean, how many man teams did you have? Talk about logistics of getting this material to where it needs to get um, uh, and uh, and how you guys overcame that. And again, uh, it's important to have a partner, setting material partner. I think that was custom building products that you worked with. Maybe talk a little bit about the system uh, uh, that you use behind the material. Okay, yeah. With the large panels, um, the system behind the material um, or the material behind the system was uh, Custom building products. Um, they we brought them in. Um, they were one of the specified manufacturers, uh, but we brought them in to develop a system for the large panels. Which you know our guys have been down for the trainings, and and uh, um, we uh, uh, think we ended up using Megalite uh, thinset custom building products, Megalite thinset on the back, uh, skim and patch for taking care of any out of tolerance conditions and, um, uh, going in with, uh, I want to say there's areas where we used red guard to bridge, um, large areas where we did use the skim and patch just to maintain, uh, moisture in the thinset during the install. Um, you know handling of the equipment you know you can see uh the guys you know we we uh we've had a lot of the the big apparatuses you know the aluminum apparatuses and stuff like that you know our guys it's it's funny because for all the money that we've invested in tools and equipment you know our guys you can see in that one picture they're actually using um kind of an archaic system but actual wood that's taped to the panels in order to hoist them and adjust them. Very, uh, very simplistic. And then on the other hand, the other picture, we've got a uh, compound blue ripper um, miter saw, actually cuts the miters, um, creating the monolithic look or cubic look of some of the stone on the walls. So we had mitered corners returning and the veining carrying around the corners. It's very, a uh, um, lot of tools, a lot of equipment to. Jeff, from a training standpoint, 
Um, is there any difference or uh, when it when you're looking at large format porcelain tile panels like this, is this is this more towards like how the guys would work with stone? Uh, and is there uh, is there are there unique differences between working with the, the these uh, book matching porcelain tile versus book matching stone? A little bit talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I, I, I believe so. I, th I think there's a lot of advantages to using the large por porcelain panels. Um, you know, this particular series, I think they have, uh, I want to say four different patterns, which, you know, you can book match in many different ways. So it's not just four different panel patterns, but you can turn those panels to create actually maybe eight or more different um, directional patterns. Um, a lot of benefit to installing a, a piece of uh, six millimeter porcelain on a wall going up 25 feet as opposed to a you know a stone where you'd end up having to anchor mechanically anchor the stone to walls so my last question to you on this and we'll get to the other projects and we'll get back to technology with you is um, from a quality control standpoint how do you make sure you know that you get adequate coverage how do you check for coverage on material like this uh um and how do you make sure there's enough open time with your mortar on these pieces uh, how many guys are working on a p on one piece i'm asking you a bunch of questions right right uh, finally finally you know um did you how do you plan for waste and uh uh um did you have and breakage and and minimize all those challenges uh, right, you right. a little bit no, about that. you know with with large format porcelain uh panels i mean you you got you got to recognize you break one piece of tile you're breaking 50 60 feet of tile at a time yeah, yeah. and you know uh you know as opposed to breaking one piece of tile you might be out you know five or six dollars for that that piece of tile you're breaking you know hundreds and hundreds of dollars at a time and not to mention the freighting and the shipping and all the other logistics that go along with replacing that piece of tile um, exactly. yeah we uh um it's uh as far as logistics go i mean we 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 um we did it we it was a complex job getting into, you know, downtown Oakland, um, very difficult. Um, you know, a lot of people working over um, us and us working in multiple areas. We, you know, we're fortunate. We've got a, I think at the time we were running about 120 guys, not on that job, but we had, we had, you know, two or three dedicated teams, one working the panels, one working the exterior pavers, um, probably, I want to say eight or nine guys on the inside, eight or nine guys on the outside, um, during this install and yeah, getting coverage on the back of the tiles is, is, uh, it's, a uh, it's quite a, quite a, a, quite a challenge to, you know, you're throwing down on a 50 foot piece of tile, you're throwing down a bag and a half of thin set or two, you know, maybe two bags of thin set on the panel, putting another bag or two on the wall, um, at the same time. There's different combing methods that you you know that you have to make sure that all the 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 keys are lining up on your on your trowels and then they zipper lock together. Um, you know the the you want to make sure that the pan, the trowel marks on the wall are going the same way as the panels. Shortest distance to evacuate all the air out of the system once you embed it. Vibrator um, sanders you know or vibrator um, cups that you know, you're holding against the wall to kind of move the air out of the system um, to make sure you've got that 100% coverage. And yeah, every once in a while you want to pull back a panel, um, make sure that you've got 100% coverage because, you know, you're dealing with six millimeters or sometimes three millimeters, depending on the panel manufacturer. But, you know, in this case, it was six, six millimeters. And, uh, you know, somebody hits a, a hollow, uh, uh, an area with a hollow spot behind it with a cart or, or you know something bangs up against it. You know, you, that's the last thing you want to do is have an air gap behind there and have it break. So it's really super important to have 100% coverage. Thanks for sharing that with me. Okay, Amber, we're going to go to Dan. We're going to go back to LA. We're moving into the film industry. So Dan, I know you had lots of uh, lots of uh, challenges to overcome. I would think, and I don't I want to speak for you, but I would think. Uh, that you really wouldn't know the substrate uh, completely until you really dug into it. So 
Uh, talk about the the uh, challenges that you guys had to overcome with this particular project. Um, to begin with, it, it was the the understanding of different products that are not common to the ceramic tile world. Um, we started using things such as a uh, hydraulic injection, ultra low shrinkage, um, flowable consolidating fine grout behind the mosaics to try to stabilize some of the areas that were delaminating. So that in itself, it, it becomes a, uh, you know, a bit of a challenge to understand that and, and to train everybody um, and work together with the conservators that have used products um, like this one and that we can put it in the hands of our guys that have been doing this for 40, 50 years. We had our foreman there that was very experienced. He was a key component to this. So um, when, when we're having to deal with these new products, um, it's very important to have somebody that is open-minded to um, not close the door on that and to start working with that and, and perform this to every single, uh, to follow every single direction um, on such thing, because now we're using, you know, uh, syringes to inject this grout per se, you know, behind. So uh, I will say that was part of the beginning to 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 do that with materials, understand that. Um, and then after that, I mean, we had about 20 sort of different products, you know, from all the different mortars, um, grouts, anti-fracture membranes, cleaners that were very specialized to remove um, corrosion and film that was uh, on this mosaic. So there was, um, there was a bit of a challenge to understand some of these products that were not common to what's a typical new installation. What about the glass material itself? Uh, did you, I think you told me that uh, you were actually very fortunate that you were able to find the original supplier. Talk about the cutting, the cutting this material and the condition of it, and uh, and and and, uh, and and basically being able to get more if you needed it at once you got started. Correct. Um, now, on the mosaic itself, the challenge on that was to try to find a match. Over the years, this building had received um, a couple of other. Uh, patching or remodels, and none of them were a good match. Um, now, I cannot take credit for finding this. Um, it was part of the preservation team. Um, they knew somebody in Italy that knew somebody, and, um, and they finally got to uh, work and, and get the manufacturer, the original manufacturer of this material, which is Orsani uh, out of Italy. And it was unbelievable that the original manufacturer was still producing the tile the exact same way they produced it uh, in the 1930s or, or even before that, which is phenomenal. And, um, and so from there, it was a, it was a matter of you know, uh, getting samples uh, of different uh, runs and sizes because we needed to match exactly what was on the building. And, um, and indeed, it was a fascinating thing to learn how they make this uh, glass mosaic, which we can go on a whole different hour on that, but it was very interesting to see that. And uh, we were very lucky to find that and, um, and, and bought that through a, um, uh, a distributor here in, in the United States. When you said that your foreman uh, had, it was very important that you selected your foreman. Is, did the foreman have experience with uh, uh, restoration projects or, uh, and, and, and how about uh, as far as being safe and, and, and managing uh, the crews uh, uh, on the vertical uh, components of this project? Um, in regards to safety and vertical, uh, working on scaffold, he was very safe, very conscientious. Um, had lots of experience, um, probably over 40 years. Uh, he just retired, so I'm going to guess over 40 years and um, out in the field, if not more. Um, in regards to preservation, um, you know, Premier has been been around for a while with uh, guys that have also, you know, our superintendents that have probably 45 years of experience. And, but we do lots of new installation and, you know, we have over 3000 projects um, in our logs already. When it comes to preservation, um, 
we've done a handful, but not nothing to this extent to to you know be dealing with a mosaic that involved you know over 350,000 individual pieces of gold mosaic with all kinds of different um, uh, circumstances behind them, whether it was you know thermal cracking, um, delamination, um, seismic movement. So there was a lot of stuff going on with this with this building. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Okay, we're going to move out of California, Amber. We're going to go to Guido back in Minneapolis. And I think, Amber, that Guido actually has a drawing, and uh, uh, we'll go to that in a second, but uh, just this close-up of the uh, uh, installation is just, it shows its flatness and levelness and uh, and obviously having to work with, look at a, the different materials that you're all matching. Guido, um, let's talk a little bit about overcoming, and maybe Amber, pull up the floor plan so he can talk a little bit about that uh, and uh, uh, describe, uh, there it is. I think, Guido, tell me, the, the main theme of this is, you know, kind of centering around the importance of the River Rock installation, but let's talk about the, the overcoming your challenges. Well, you can see there aren't, there aren't many street walls in that and yeah. this build. Look at all uh, the, the curvature. Yeah, the radius yeah. cuts must have been incredible. Yeah. Right. And and you know that they are challenges and you need we needed to set an expectation. And quite frankly, I've been at Grigine Brothers for 40 years and we believe that the process is important. And so we initiate that process and that's uh review, submittal, uh, we acquire the materials and uh, we install we, we plan our work and then we work the plan and it's important to uh, in any project when you've decided on the plan to stick with the plan uh you know it's too easy to abandon that when you uh you reach a roadblock but as you can as you can see there was a lot of work that had to get done before us and that work had to be put in per the plans it had to be done accurately and so that was one of the conversations that we had to have with uh, with the general contractor that the work before us needed to be as drawn if the finished product was going to be uh, as drawn and so uh, there was a lot of checking and a lot of uh, review of of the, the systems that went in before us framing and sheetrock and uh, concrete substrates and uh, after that if i don't know if you can zoom in on this thing but while the architect was pretty detailed, we wanted to make sure that to the best of our ability, they understood what we were giving them. And if you looked closely at this floor plan, this is actually our shop drawing, uh, you'll notice that there are many different colors of tile. Yeah. All the field tiles are 12 by 24s. Uh, so, you know, that wasn't a real big issue, but how they interacted, how wide each of those bands were, what the radiuses were, for the different sections of the river uh, that winds through there uh, were important to the architect. So we made sure that we specified we're going to put in, you know, two rows of this color and then there's three rows of this color. Uh, all those intersecting radiuses uh, are dimensioned on the drawing so that the architect understood what we were giving him. Uh, there were no questions. He, I don't think he ever came out to the job and said, what is this? because we stuck to the shop drawing and he approved it. He knew what he was getting and he that's what he wanted. And, and so that's what we gave him. How many different crews, did you have different crews doing the River Rock versus doing the other products? And how many people were involved? How many guys were working in the field on this project? As you can imagine, uh, there probably aren't too many general contractors that'll give you that entire area. Right. All of it. So we, you know, we had to, pick our starting point. It happened to be in the middle where everything came together. And then we went both ways. And we had one crew putting in the 12 by 24s and another crew putting in the, the pebbles. And that just, it lessened the learning curve uh, for the installation, allowed guys to focus on on one installation and uh, the, comp the components of that installation. And uh, it, it, it worked well because after that initial learning curve, you know, we were, we were getting uh, good production and a real quality installation. You know, one thing that hits me 
when we talk about new technology and uh, you know you hear this all the time i've been doing it a certain way for 30 years but you know some of this stuff is really new new systems new new tile new types of tile i've been in the business a long time but i i learned i i've heard some i heard something in your uh um explanation that i'd never heard before which is that you had to use a large wood compass with a string for the lobby center radius and you told me when i talked to you before that that's old school so talk tell me a little bit about that before we that, move on that really is old school uh, some of these radiuses are 85 feet and 90 feet and it's it's difficult to to get that you know marked out accurately and we we basically used a, uh, a wire and a, and a pen. And uh, before the partition walls were installed, where we could, we were able to stretch that and lay out those radiuses so that uh, they were as accurate as possible. But it is pretty old school. There were no computers or lasers involved with that. It was a, uh, it was a Sharpie and a, a long piece of wire anchored at the, uh, at the center point. That's pretty cool. Okay, Amber, you can move on to the technology. Um, we are gonna go to a poll question. We've got about 20 minutes left. We're doing great with our time. Um, this one I think is good. Uh, the question says, uh, share with us as our audience, uh, it says your favorite new technology. I would actually uh, interject that, that maybe what you think maybe is your, the most important new technology or product developments that you've seen uh, uh, as an emerging trend uh, in the tile industry or that you're seeing more of, whether if you're in specification or in distribution or if you're an installer. And uh, we'll share that with you when we get back. So um, very interested in what people say. You know, I, 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 I've definitely seen a lot of new technology come in in the last 10 years uh, and a lot of it's really changing. But on the same token, what I, what I think is really cool about this discussion or this presentation is, that we also there's there's no replacement to training and experience and some of the uh, installers that are that are on these that were on these three specific projects uh, have a proven track record of success uh, on these types of projects and have been around for a while in, in a lot of ways because uh, there's just so much uh, technology and so much skills that you see uh, from that standpoint. So again, we'll let you have time to answer that question. And Amber, we can go on to the technology side. I want to. Uh, I think we're going to stick uh, with uh, Guido, which is a good segue. Guido, we talked about old school, the wood compass, which you had to you had to find you know use something that you've got done for years and years, a wood compass with a string. But you also use new technology on this project. I'm assuming you used a lot of lasers. Talk a little bit about some of the newer technology that you guys implemented on this particular project to achieve the look that we see here on this picture uh well that that main gallery area is uh you know over 230 feet long uh, and again we we didn't have access to the whole thing but we had to confirm that the layout worked you know through through the the length of the gallery and we did we used lasers to uh to get that work done to make sure that uh uh, the pattern would work. Uh, there were uh, an instance or two where uh, there was an issue and we were able to work through it. And it not, it, it didn't become a, a fire drill uh, because we were there ahead of time making sure that things were working out. But we did, we used, uh, we used lasers. All the setting materials we used were uh, pay products. And uh, it's amazing uh, what the different formulations can do and and uh, how you can use them uh, you know for different types of materials and get an installation that uh, is one high quality and two will stand the test uh, and, and be around for a long time what is the role of the setting material company you mentioned mape and i know dan uh, or jeff mentioned custom building products what's the on a project like this do, you, do, the, do they have tech reps out there with your with their products uh, involved in this we uh, we do call on the pay when we get uh, when we're involved with projects that require uh, things uh, installations that are outside the norm. Yeah, uh, and, and because a lot of the materials that uh, center material manufacturers make uh, can can be adapted to several different installations, and so we do use them when we need to. Uh, we get them out there. Our rep is very responsive, uh, 
you know, it, he'll show up on a project and uh, he has good technical knowledge, as they all do. Uh, but, um, you know, we appreciate that partnership because yeah, think, sometimes there are questions. Yeah, I think it's really important that uh, our installation material companies support our, our contracting companies the way they do, and certainly on projects of this kind of scope and magnitude. All right, we're going to switch back to Oakland and back to uh, Jeff. You know, Jeff, one thing that we're seeing in the tile industry um, is, and some of this is residential, but also commercial, uh, and I, I think is really, really cool, uh, is the use of pedestal systems uh, to be installed uh, in exterior applications. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the system you, you chose, uh, or was that specified, or did uh, uh, Deanza choose that and talk a little bit about what the you know wh how that works and how that uh, how that went from a seamless standpoint uh, in installing pedestals. I think you had to raise it to different heights also, right? Right, right. So um, we went with a Basan system, and they were specified as one of the one of the suitable or acceptable uh, vendors for the pedestal system. Um, we reached out to them. Um, they actually designed the entire system as far as the parts, pieces, and components that would work, um, given the, the geography of the of the uh, terrain that we were working over. Um, and the, you know, to describe the terrain that we were working over, I mean, we had we had an area out the um, north side of the building that actually had to slope away. It act, you know, it was needed to be flat in one plane, but it needed to slope um, away from the building for additional moisture or water water mitigation. Um, and you know, they, we implemented the use of uh, these large panels, eight foot panels that had to maintain one plane. Um, and then we had uh, we had catch basins um, for the water, all the water that gets underneath the system. They, they, goes down into one corner where these catch basins go to, you know, three and four feet deep. Um, so we had pedestals um, on every corner of every tile and sometimes in the middle of these um, pavers that were three, four feet tall, so. Did you did you grout do you grout did you grout those systems on the pedestal systems or no? No, no, this was made so uh, moisture would get through the system down to the substrate and then drain towards the catch basins. So, but yet you still had to match the material from inside to outside. How did you do that? Yeah. Yeah. So that um, I mean, from the front of the building to the back of build, back of the building, through the interior, we used the same pet pavers. And then once you got to the outside, everything had to align on both the front of the building and the back of the building on the exteriors. So we had patterns, and I, I don't know if there's one of the pictures that you had up earlier that. You can see there's a, a grid pattern that runs through uh, different colors that runs through the building and uh, tying those together was challenging, especially because we started the outside on both ends before we did the inside. Do you see this pedestal type technology uh, get gaining in popularity as we get to like thicker materials like the like the three centimeter and, and larger type uh, porcelains uh, moving forward for both commercial and residential projects? Yeah, absolutely. I, we've seen it. Uh, we've seen it on a lot of our clients up in the city. You know, with the the balconies. Um, you know, everybody wants a little nicer surface to get, to be able to get up and out on roof decks. It's becoming uh, a lot more popular. Um, this particular system um, um, that we're installing here, we're, we noticed that it's being installed just down the street on a similar project um, in in the city there. Um, yeah, it's gaining gaining uh, gaining ground. I think uh, one of the one of the things that um, uh, engineering is is probably the most vital portion to these projects. You know, I mean, you know, is two centimeter acceptable? Four centimeter? Um, you know, because there's there's a, a much like much like a, much like an anchored system on an exterior, you know, you have wind, you know, wind shear and stuff like that that, that can affect the system. That's great. Okay, we're gonna switch back to the film industry. Dan, we're bringing you back in. This, we talk, we, we, I'm wanting to ask about new technology, yet you're restoring a 1930s building. Um, what kind of, uh, 
like chisels and uh, and tools. What what kind of new technology did you have to implement to restore a building uh, from where it was installed in the 30s? Right. So to begin with, it, it wasn't like we could remove per se a, a square area of you know three feet by two feet and and another square area. What we had to do is after every single piece was tapped in individually, then it was we needed to determine what was hollow, what was broken, uh, what had delamination from the gold. So as you can see on that picture right now, those are pictures with some red dots. We had green dots, we have blue dots, all for all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. And so to start the removal, uh, we had to use uh, Dremel tools with a one inch diamond blade. So that when we will drill out the 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 grout we will not damage and and create more collateral damage to the pieces around it because we're trying to save as much as possible so we were using um, tiny little dremels to to do that and then to remove the the mosaic itself and mortar that was there from whether it was 60 years or in some cases when they did previous repairs it was epoxy we started using a pneumatic chisel with a, a very low um, vibration so that we wouldn't again damage everything that was around it so that in itself was very tedious um, and uh, it was a bit of a new technology to for us to to use um, these tools definitely that's great um, it, it looks like something came in I amber I'll bring you in or, or Michelle if you did you did you have any uh, results to share from the poll at all or uh, or how do you want to handle that amber or Michelle yeah no I um, asked everyone to put it in the chat and the theme is very much large format um, you know it's it's all about GPT uh, XXL those are the comments that I got I got a few more um, I have, we have an architect uh, on here who he feels that um, the uh, newer large format tile and stone options are very pleasing as an architect from their perspective. Uh, we also had Ruben who said new technology and thin set mortars, lightweight and gel polymers. Um, so yeah, we have a couple different ones. And then we had one which was about um, fast track installation products that help decrease downtime as well as cordless tool innovations. Okay. So this is kind of across the board of what we got back. Okay, and what about our audience? Is it from all over the place? Were they mostly installers or did we have uh, Actually, different? Actually, no, interestingly, 34% were distributors or manufacturers. That's great. 28% 20, were actually other. Um, and then we had 18% specifiers, 16% installers, and 3% retailers. Yeah, so I did see the question come in. I think that uh, Joseph said, as an architect, newer large format tile and stone options are pleasing as an architect, and I, I love that. I, I, I'm just going to pick on you, Guido. One thing that I've seen uh, in doing talks to specifiers and architects over the years with some of this larger format tile is there's sometimes a misconception about um, uh, that perhaps the bigger tiles, the labor should should actually cost less. Can you talk a little bit about uh, 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 when you're working with these kinds of formats, how do you factor in your uh, labor quotes and, and compare that to an old, I'll say a 24 by 24 tile installation? Well, we've, uh, we've trained quite a few of our uh, field crews on uh, installing large panel porcelain. So we were able to get an idea uh, but I'm sure Jeff uh, Jeff knows as well as I do that there's uh, so much more handling, uh, so much more precision involved in a larger piece, so much more waste. I mean, uh, as Jeff said, you know, you you miscut a 12 by 24 inch tile, and uh, you know you're you're throwing away six bucks. You miscut a five by ten panel, and the whole thing is junk. And so uh, there's a lot more involved, and uh, it's a, I don't know that it's as uh, more technical than any other type of tile setting. Once you understand the system, uh, it's tile setting. Uh, you are, you're trawling more, uh, more at a time. You're putting, you know, 50, 50 square feet of thin set on a panel, but um, there's a lot more involved to get, uh, uh, to get that piece on the wall than, uh, you know, to even just to lay, you know, the same uh, 25 pieces of 12 by 24. 
Yeah, that's very interesting, Jeff. Uh, to segue on that, you know, once once the large format panels came in, there's a learning curve to train people and 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 get the, get it down to a science on how you do it. Has the has the price of your labor costs stayed the same, or have, as you've done more and more of these projects, have you been able to get that down to you know to to lower that a little bit? Just wondering. Yeah, it's, it's much like uh, Guido was saying. You know, we're we're you know it's when you're hold, when you're handling a large format tile or large panel tile, you you know you you might have three four guys touching the same tile. Um, so uh, if you're putting down 50 feet of tile, you know, you divide that by, you know, four guys and you're putting down 12 feet, 12 feet or 12 and a half feet per guy. Um, and, uh, but the, the amount of thin set material, labor and everything, you know, and then the waste, the waste is probably the, the most critical uh, component um, with pricing because I've had jobs with, you know, and, and it's hard to understand or hard for people to understand, but I've had jobs with, uh, over a hundred percent waste on jobs, um, just because of the size of the tile or the size of the areas that you're you're installing. So you know, prices is very price varies, and so does your labor and and uh, components. But yeah, it, we are becoming a lot more um, diligent as as we handle it more. These larger jobs like this um, definitely uh, definitely help. I'm almost out of time. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions in Michelle or Amber. Uh, if not, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, skills and craftsmanship here. Um, uh, if there are Amber or Michelle, you can pop in. Yeah, there are some questions, um, but yeah, I can also push them out uh, no, afterward. Let's, let's, no, let's okay. do that. Yeah. There was what a question. I I believe it was on Guido's project. Um, okay. uh, who was the architect of the project? Excellent question. I wish I could recall. <laughs> I don't well, recall. We I could, think we went through the entire project. That's the one thing I didn't look at. Yeah. Well, so McGuff could get the answer. answer. Yeah. yeah, we we could get the answer for yep. them. Perfect. Any, any other and questions? And then yes, in Dan's project, once the exact same tiles were found in Italy, why did you not remove everything and make the whole installation instead of injecting a grout behind the loose tile? Oh, that's a great question, Dan. Because this project was assigned to be a historic landmark, and you cannot remove everything and then still consider it a historic landmark. Um, it was very important for the city of LA to um, uh, save as much as possible from window frames to mosaic tile to stone. Um, so that was the 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 goal of it to try to save as much as possible and consider it and keep it. A historic building yeah, and is there funding available for that is that is that part of it and, and i'm also thinking that this is what they do in europe a lot right is to is to restore buildings and you want uh you have to you have to utilize a percentage of that uh original material correct i mean it's way easier to to demo and rebuild new right uh, it's much harder to try to bring a building that is 60 70 100 years old to current engineering uh, conditions and architectural um, standards um, and inside and outside of the building because a lot of things have changed per code. So um, definitely there is a percentage and, and they go through these as far as what is optimal and, and how much you can remove and how much you can leave there. You know, they have their, their own set of rules of how to do that. And then to make it at a certain point that it can still qualify to do that. Yeah, we may see more and more of these projects as our as our country gets older. That's that's very very interesting. Well, we're about out of time, but I did want to mention that all three of our uh, award winning contractors here are union uh, contractors, um, both uh, five star contractors through the NTCA, and I believe all three of them are also Chal of Excellence contractors out of the Tile Contractors Association of America. Uh, Jeff. To you, while we finish, um, were all are all of your guys or all the guys on your job? Uh, are they uh, were they um, uh, employees of De Anza or did you bring guys out of the hall? Uh, how much do you use of employees versus bringing guys on the hall when you have large projects? Just curious. Yeah, they were 100% all of our employees. Okay. Uh, yeah, we 
we have uh, large established crews. So, and then so from a training standpoint, you know, uh, how important is that apprenticeship program to companies like yours as you hire uh, guys coming out? Oh, vital. Yeah, and we we put we really push our guys to stay in the training. They have continued education um, within the JATC or the um, Joint Apprenticeship Programs. Uh, all of our guys are ACT certified or working through getting ACT certified. So um, for those advanced credentials. That's great. Well, it's two o'clock. I, I just want to thank all three of you uh, for participating with us. Uh, Michelle, there's no other questions that I, I might have interrupted you on that. So um, no, there's one and it's more specific and something that, uh, you know, you can answer after the fact directly to the to the question. OK. All right. Yeah. Well, we're out of time. Um, Amber, anything to add? Um, I just like to add that all these projects, they utilize qualified labor and for the architects, designers, owners, anyone out there that it's very easy for you to try and include qualified labor on your projects, request it. You can add it in your specifications in both BSD spec link. You could turn it on very easily as well as master spec has language in there to utilize for qualified labor. And you could reach out to the NTCA if you have questions on that, and I can help you out with any, you know, anything, wording, any of that. Yeah, and no, you know, no, no, uh, no disrespect to other trades, but uh, if I hope, uh, I'm glad that Michelle shared with everybody the different um, uh, backgrounds everybody had that was watching today. And I hope, if anything, uh, what we've shown you with these three award-winning projects is the unique skills and craftsmanship uh, that are required uh, behind the scenes to bring these projects to life. I mean, we're talking about engineering, we're talking about math, we're talking about construction, un you know, understanding of, of mortars and grouts, of waterproofing, crack isolation. This is not, uh, these three particular projects are not just uh, something that you learn uh, uh, your installers don't learn this kind of skill uh, in a, uh, you know, on an online test or, 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 or certainly over a, a period of weeks. This takes years uh, to get the skills that these installers have, and we're really proud at NTCA to be affiliated with all three of these uh, contractors and these three projects. So thanks, guys, uh, for mm -hmm. participating today. We really appreciate it. And. Uh, mm -hmm. With that, yep. uh, Amber and Michelle, uh, we, we would like to thank you all yep. and wish everybody a happy National Tile Day. Uh, and thank you. And again, thanks to the panel on behalf of Coverings Connected. You guys were great. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. We appreciate it if you complete it and provide us feedback. That helps us with our education in the future. And then we hope you'll join us for our next Coverings Connected, which will take place on April 28th, and then in person in Orlando, July 7th through 9th. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.